This week's podcast is sponsored by Vivo Barefoot Shoes. We've been wearing them for six years and genuinely they are our favourite shoes and that is all we wear beyond being barefoot. Yeah, they're really, really great. They have tons of different varieties. Uh, you get 15% off with the code HAPPYPAIR15. And if you don't like them, what do you do, Dave? You can send them back within 100 days. So if you're interested, vivobarefoot.com and the code is HAPPYPAIR15. Anyone listening to this, so this is an amazing podcast. You will absolutely adore it. But when you're listening to this, you go, okay, how do I start to cook more in season? How do I start using what's local and in my surrounds? So one of the keys of... I think of happiness, at least for me anyway, personally, is knowing how to cook food. This used to be a skill that was taught down through your family and it was a basic life skill, but so many of us have forgotten it. So <clears throat> with that in mind or that context, we have our plant-based masterclass course starting on the 18th of September. There's a free webinar which starts on the 14th of September. That's free. Come along. Learn kind of the principles and some of the skills that make up because many of us approach food like with a recipe and that you got to follow the recipe and oh my god a courgette is a courgette or a zucchini is a zucchini or like a pepper is a pepper but anyone who grows their own food realizes that like if I were to pick a courgette like at the start of the season they're small they're succulent they are elegant you can chew them raw like a cucumber versus if you get a marrow they're massive they're watery they're slightly flavorless sorry I do love you too marrow but um yeah, just like food is much more complex than we have have approached it. Anyway, if you want to learn the principles of plant-based cooking, check out our masterclass. As I said, there's a free one on the 14th and it starts the 18th. And similarly, we have a sourdough one which starts on the 13th of September. So check them out on our website, thehappypair.ie. Welcome to Happy Pair Podcast. Steve here. I am honoured to have you here. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is an amazing episode. Please brace yourself. On our podcast, I don't think I've ever cried. This one I actually cried on because um, Jade just speaks from the heart so beautifully. So who is Jade Miles for anyone who doesn't know? It? Jade has the bush in her bones and business in her head. Jade is a polyjobist to the core. She's a local food advocate, educator, business builder, food co-op founder, author, podcaster, regenerative heritage fruit farmer and CEO of Sustainable Table. Remarkable lady that really talks from the heart, talks about connecting to nature, talks about connecting to our ancestral wisdom, talks about what is enoughness. I love this conversation. I think her message is so needed. I think she's an, a salve to modern day living. Uh, and I think ultimately she talks about connection, meaning presence, purpose and connecting to nature. Without further ado, we give you the wonderful Jade Miles. Ta-da! Oh, there oh, you are. I look quite at yellow. Oh, yeah, that's, you look like you're at a bonfire. <laughs> that looks cool. Oh, there we are. Now we're better. It looks like almost like morning <laughs> that's light. better. <laughs> I li- yeah, I'm in my... My mother's house because I'm in Melbourne with work for the week away from the farm. Oh, cool. And so I'm just st- stuck myself in there studying. And are the boys with you? The boys not? No, the boys are at home. Uh, the whole family's at home. So um, oh, that must I kind be of great live this dual life where I'm sometimes farming and I'm sometimes food system advocating and I'm on the road. So at the moment, I'm on the road. Wow. Do you enjoy that? Um, look. Uh, there are parts of it that I really love because I think that, you know, the storytelling and the connecting with communities is really critical and I love that part of it and I love activating conversations in community. But I I actually revel in just hours and hours and hours of life on the farm and the deep rhythm that comes with life on the farm is probably where I'm my most happy. Yeah, and sometimes, sometimes it's nice, like I know myself and I travel, there's always that sadness leaving and then that excitement and freedom and liberation. And it's like, wow, I have no little responsible, you know, little parcels of responsibility <laughs> that I look after. And it's like, what do I want to do? <laughs> yeah, 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 which is lovely. I know. Well, actually, I wrote to my publisher a week ago and said, I've just realised I'm about to be on the road for three weeks, which means I have no children and I have no farm that I'm responsible for. So in all the gaps, I can write my book and actually get it to you on the due date. So I'm writing my second book at the moment. So um, that's kind of liberating. It now means that when I wake at four in the morning, I can just start writing rather than having to go out into the paddock and milk goats. Wow. Good on your future setting part two. Yeah, it's called Huddle. Oh, I like that. That's kind of cool. And it, yeah. like it, it kind of almost, when I hear it, it kind of things like togetherness, united. Yeah. Let's gather around. That's Beautiful. it. You yeah. nailed it. Yeah. 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 Come together. 
I like that. Well, good on you, Jay. Great to have you on. Really appreciate your work and uh, admire what you do. Um, I'd love to just ask straight away is just how you got into it, because like you're so far down the rabbit hole and such an advocate for, you know, connecting to nature, connecting to our food system, understanding soil, the earth, understand that we're intric- in, in, intrinsically a part of nature as opposed to this separate thing. And I just wonder, like, were you brought up in this or how did you get to this place? Because you're such a spokesperson for it and maybe you weren't always this way. Uh, no, I have always been this way. Oh, wow. I grew up in the bush and um, my dad What is does that mean for someone from Ireland mom... and England who doesn't have that, that term, the bush? Like, <laughs> I go like, did you grow up in a bush? <laughs> or like, <what? laughs> Sorry, excuse my ignorance. It's a very Aussie term. You're it's right. cool though. It's cool. I you really like it. Say in the wilderness or in the forest. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, the Aussie bush. Rural Australia. I grew up in in a little tiny community that my very broad and sprawling extended family was also in, so the village that I grew up in. And all of the surrounding villages were filled to the brim with cousins and aunties and uncles. And um, my parents were fairly ideological in the first decade of my life, really, and they were both permaculture practitioners. Oh, geez, they were early. They were early too, weren't they? They were really, really early. It was... You know, Bill Mollison was sort of right there in in all of it while it was all forming, and um, they were pretty ideological in that, you know, whatever they didn't grow, they traded, and whatever we couldn't make from scratch, or an auntie or uncle couldn't make from scratch, um, we went without, or we traded with others who could, um, and we lived super simply. So I guess. You know, little things like dad was an artist and mum was um, a nurse, so she was at work and dad would have us for the day, but he was in painting, so he'd lock himself in the studio and he'd lock us out of the house so we didn't make a mess. And so we we literally, you know, got used to living on whatever we could forage or whatever we could could pull up from the veggie garden or the orchard. And so we got very used to understanding what time of year it was based on the food we were finding and the way we were feeding ourselves. So my brother and I spent a huge amount of time... um, Living pretty bohemian in a pretty bohemian way, and then also my dad spent a lot of time painting on country with Aboriginal communities, and we would go out with him. And you know, dad would go off and paint during the day, and we'd knock about camp and just keep the fire ticking, and you know, keep our snake stick with us. And so we lived a pretty a snake um, stick. So that's like a stick to ward off snakes. Sorry, I'm a bit afraid of snakes, and we've known in yeah, Ireland since so this yeah. slight obscure <laughs> fascination with them. Fearful yeah. fascination, I'd yeah. probably go with. That fearful fascination. Yeah, I didn't develop that till adulthood once I'd had children myself. But um, yeah, snake stick, you kind of need one when you're in the bush on your own without an adult around. And you had to. we always had to keep camp in sight. So we could wander and explore, but we had to keep camp in sight. So this sort of way of being was fairly intrinsic and intuitive for both my brother and I. Um, and really... I moved to the city with my mum when I was about 14 and immersed myself in another life, which was interesting because I'd always been the slightly weird kid. You know, I had parents who packed or we packed our lunches based on whatever we were pulling up out of the veggie garden at the time and it was nearly always just chopped up raw veggies and slightly mushy, manky, fresh fruit from a tree that had, (laughs) you know, worms and birds in it. So we were sort of the weird kids and then I came to Melbourne in my teenage years and really just wanted to fit in and so I really tried to conform. But by the time I was 18, I had pretty strong desire to have my hands back in the dirt where I really um, was able to build a rhythm with it. I I knew once you could feel the warmth in the sun on your back that it was time to get your annual seedlings in and, you know, I, I knew that once things were going to seed, it was time to hang them upside down and dry them for next year's crop. So I, I've sort of been doing that all my life and it really is the pretty deep rhythmic nature of every year. And so I've done that really since early adulthood and I was very lucky to meet an amazing bloke, an amazing husband early on and at 20, just 21 we left the city with our degrees in our pocket and went back to the bush, went back not to where I grew up sadly, I went back to where his family were and um, yeah, we were 
we were sort of embarking on what our life together would look like, and we got ourselves a veggie garden going pretty early, and bought and kind of isolated yourself, like miners' cottage. Like, did you go just pick a, pick a spot and kind of almost like just start afresh? Was it near his his family, so there was that sense of community and roots, or was it like, no, let's start a new um, thing just as a couple? It, it was definitely in the region that he he grew up in, but his parents and family weren't right there. But that actually did cause, you've touched on a slightly uh, triggering nerve there because <laughs> apologies. I'm super <laughs> close to, to my family and my family is massive and they're, you know, my grandmother is still alive. And, and they sound cool. And your family uncles. sounds slightly wild. I like, the, I, I'd love to go hang out with your family. They sound great. <laughs> my dad's family are really wild. I can my imagine. My mum's family are not as wild, but there's a lot of them. But um, going Going to his region really left me feeling a little bit like I was almost drowning a bit. I didn't understand the landscape. I didn't understand the seasons in the same way. I didn't couldn't read the light. I didn't have that deeply entrenched sense of belonging in the community that I'd moved to. And it took me a really long time to feel like I had a place. It probably took me a decade. And in that time, I started a, a food co-op and... Um, worked with the community to write a local food action plan and to build a local food policy. Jeez, you were right in it straight um, from the start. You were into advocacy. You were into let's change this system. (laughs) Yeah, the system is so bloody broken. Well, that was because I was living on a plateau and I still live on this plateau but in a different house now on our farm. I was living on a plateau that for four or five generations had been managed by family scale orchardists and at its peak in the 30s and 40s, there were, you know, 40 family farms that were growing apples or pears or, or cherries. And by the time I got there, they were down to about 18. And in, the, and in the first five or six years that I'd been there, I watched that drop down to just three. Wow. So now they're on that plat- same plateau. And so at 21, I was asking these multi-generational farmers why they were pushing incredible orchards out that were at their absolute prime of production and their simple answer repeatedly from all of them was that there's no money in small-scale farming, there's um, no reliability in the seasonality or the, the climate impact anymore and I've got no succession plan because the next generation aren't interested in farming because of what, what we've just said. The system is so broken that I don't want to work 100 hours a week and you know be the price taker um, and I've got no control over where my food goes and what it sells for. So I can't tell the story anymore because that's not what the system's geared around. And so we're pushing the trees out. The land value is higher without the trees on it for lifestyle as, as opposed to agricultural farmers. So we're out. And that really made my husband and I start to question the system as a whole. And so at that point we said, let's understand what it looks like when the system gets rebuilt from a localised perspective. And so we went to Vermont in USA. Big trip. Woo-hoo, and we had go a, Jade. A, what's that? Big trip. It was a yeah, big Vermont, trip. We USA, took the kids too. I don't, I don't know that they loved us for it. We traipsed them from farm gate to farmer's market to food co-op for about three months. But um, uh, look... In what it showed us was that a community is similar size to the one we lived in, in a sort of ecosystem or a um, geography that was quite similar in terms of the landscape and proximity to bigger capital centres could in fact build a localised food system. And that could look, you know, really interesting in lots of different ways. So we took all of those ideas back to our community and said, what does it look like if we try and build it here? And... Um, I'd say Australia is still probably a solid decade behind where the US is at um, and certainly some of the European and and um, UK pockets. But we're definitely getting there and COVID certainly encouraged the, expedite, the expedited process of that because um, we just didn't have food and we're so prone to natural disasters like fire and flood and drought that roads get closed and communities get cut off and, you know, this is starting to become an everyday reality for Australians, especially regional Australians. And so food security and food sovereignty is something that we're we're really focused on on trying to change systemically. So um yeah, that's I that's love a very that. long week. 
But I loved it. I, I, I wanted to sit back and just listen. I love I love the way you talk about things and describe it. I love the way you described I didn't know how to read the light and to kind of read the landscape because that's not the way typically people uh-huh. relate to their environment or to their natural system aside from their house they live in. Like, I think it's beautiful the fact that you talk about, you know, with such proximity and such closeness that it's like, I didn't know how to read the landscape. I didn't know how to read the light. And I wonder, you know, maybe it was you growing up in the bush like that, that you had this deep attached relationship to to the outside world, whereas most people don't have it. You know, most people to read light, I'm like, how do you read light? Are you a photographer? I can read light. Yeah, no, well, I'm not, but my dad is an artist and it was something that was encouraged from a very young age to deeply observe your place and understand the weather patterns and know where your water comes from and know where your, you know, prevailing weather systems come from and know what different light means and the length of shadows and, you know, the depth of colour in your surroundings and the differing greens that you see that represent, you know, a change of season or so I think, you know, it's actually something or it's a skill set that sits in all of us. It's it's deep ancestral knowing if we t- truly lean into belonging in a in a place. And I think in order to change the system, and I mean the entire system, not just the food system, the system that is currently dominated by this prevailing story around endless growth, we need to push back on capitalism which is really what has framed our understanding of who we are as individuals in the ecosystem that we exist in right now and the way to do that is to and you said at the very beginning um it's to understand that we are not separate from the the living ecosystem that holds us we have this critically intertwined symbiotic relationship with it and we sit no higher in the pecking order than the trees that are in our landscape, than the micro horizontal fungi that sits in the landscape, than the birds who sing and talk to us. And if we can learn to read and feel and understand all of those things, then it gives you a, an incredibly deep appreciation for your role in it. And um, I think having had that from a very early age and, and uh, that deep knowing that I belonged somewhere so entirely that you know, my gut microbiome spoke to the soil that was around me because the vast majority of my food got pulled from the from the dirt under my feet and in my fingernails. I belonged, and that belonging has given me the confidence to to really push and drive and be what I I want to be in this world, which is someone who's thinking systemically and intentionally and curiously and with humility in the world that is around me. And um, I think that that is actually something that I think is gravely lacking in the culture mm, in the West 100%. that we live in, in the Western world. And yeah. I think I thought for a very, very long time that if we could change the food system, that that was the foundation that would underpin significant change for food sovereignty and for land access and for food um, access and for equality and for, you know, opportunities to connect to place. But I think, um, and that's where I'll stay, that's definitely where my where my place is in the system and that's in food. That's because farming provides this opportunity to kind of unpack all of that on a micro scale. But I think it's a cultural thing. I think we, what we ultimately need to do is reframe and make more humble our role in the world. And that's really confronting to unpack oh, because, you know, we think as humans that if we are the master of our environment and we're in control and we can have what we want when we want it for a price we're willing to pay, regardless of the outcomes of those decisions that we've made and the impact that that has on other ecosystems and other humans and other animals, I think we think we're in control and that puts us at the top of the pecking order and we feel better about ourselves and it soothes our ego. So it's really hard to be confronted by the reality that we're not in control and uh, we're not at the top of the pecking order and that we actually need to come at this in a way that really does acknowledge our insignificance. 
So, boy, I'm really going into a whole different direction. No, you're today, doing great. But, no, this um, is this is you're so on it because I think it is this humility that's required. Like it's like so many of us are nature illiterate. Like we do not know that what we do to nature is what we do to ourselves. We do like you speak of like being able to read the light and I'm like, geez, where'd you learn to do that? That's cool. Or like the depth of the shadows. It's like, wow, cool. I'm like 43 and I'm only learning this stuff and only starting to like learn it as we have our own farm. But it's like, this is something that is not taught in our capitalistic societies. Typically, you know, you're taught to read, to write, you know, the farm as you spoke of on the plateau there where they kind of they couldn't make it work. And part of the reason probably why they couldn't make it work was that they were being sold that their life, the way they were living, simply and elegant, wasn't enough. You know, they were being sold pictures of more, you know, you could go on more holidays and you could have a bigger car and then you'll be happy like these people here. Whereas previous, when there wasn't such access to media, there were probably, life was just simple and elegant. And, you know, you were happy just sitting out eating apples well, and, you know, it was simpler. There, there was an understanding well, I think of enoughness. long supply <laughs> chains is what's truly impacted their ability to live comfortably, yeah. even if they were living simply. I mean, there's two elements. There's the cultural element of wanting more, not just simplicity. But they, but there's Dropped also long supplies can eaters from the fit they're eating. And as long as they don't know the name of their farmer, and they don't understand the vagaries that that farmer has faced to understand why the apples might be smaller or the broccoli may be lumpier or, you know, the peas may not have been as pollinated so they're not as big and fat and full. You know, whatever it might be, if they're not in that the, prox the geographic proximity of where that food was grown, they can't ask the question of the farmer and they can't truly understand it themselves to realise that, there were really late frost or there were really heavy hail falls that year or there were particularly strong winds in harvest period or, you know, there was lots of rain during blossom period. You know, for all of those, like if you live in the area that your food is grown, you intrinsically understand why those vagaries impact your ability to produce food. And then you're more understanding of Jade the farmer when she says, sorry, all I've got at the moment is two varieties of apple because everything else got knocked off by hail. So you're more inclined to say, okay, well, that's all she's got. That's what I'm going to buy and I'm going to learn how to use that particular product or I'm going to um, buy more of it to make sure she's still viable for next year or, no, I'm going to value you as my farmer. And you don't do that when there's long supply chains. Yeah, what does, like, for, for anyone listening, like, who, like, I've worked in food for 20 years now, so I have a good, under, or a reasonable understanding of it. For, for anyone listening who's going, okay, long supply chains, that sounds interesting. What does that mean? Uh, what the heck is a long supply chain? I mean, that is the majority of what our food system is um, managed by now in your country and mine. Any developed country really um, has moved beyond a localised food system for the most part. And in this particular country, we're dominated by just two main players. It's a duopoly in our supermarket system. And they run on a three-day just-in-time system, which means that there's only ever three days worth of food in any supermarket at any given time. And so we need to make sure that that long supply chain, which is everything that um, consists of the farmer at one end, right through the truck drivers and the wholesale markets and the value adders and the um, the exporters and the packages and the ships and the supermarket retailer right to you at the eater end. So everything that belongs between the farmer and the eater is your supply chain. A long supply chain is one where it takes a really long time and a whole lot of individuals to get it to you. A short supply chain is where there are the fewest number possible between the person that grows it and the person that eats it. And so if you go to a farmer's market as the eater, you'll meet the farmer and there's no one between the two of you. In all likelihood, that food was picked and, and packed this morning, which means it's really a highly um, nutrient. It probably means it hasn't travelled very far, so its food miles are minimal, and it's likely that it won't have any packaging on it, which means you're not generating any single-use waste. It also means you can have a conversation with your farmer and you can look them in the eye and you can give them a hug and... Um, you know, you can buy something that you might not have ever tried before and you can learn about what you do with those things because they'll tell you. Um, and it means you get to know them and you develop a beautiful relationship with them and you uh, understand their experience of growing the food that they're producing for you to put on the plate of your family's 
meal times. So you get such an incredibly rich experience from um, a short supply chain, but you get a transactional experience from a long supply chain. And the transactional experience has a role right now because what it does is it takes food from faraway places and it puts them in urban environments where the vast majority of our population is based. And it's highly packaged. It's probably um, significantly older from its place of being picked um, or since it was picked to the time that it takes to get on your plate. It's probably less nutrient rich because of that fact. Um, It's possibly going to be cheaper because it was mass produced at scale in a monoculture, which isn't reflective of what a natural ecosystem will ever create. Monocultures don't exist in natural ecosystems. And the likelihood that you will value every part of the food that you've purchased at a lower price in a single-use packaged environment from a really long way away is much, much, much lower because you don't value the person that put the work in to create it for you and you probably paid less for it because of their scaling capabilities that you're really happy to waste it. And so in Australia, and I'm not sure what your stats are, but I suspect they're probably similar, in Australia 50% of all food that is produced is wasted. And the vast majority of that is wasted at the farm gate or at the wholesale gate. It doesn't even make it off the farm often because um, it doesn't meet regulation for the supermarket requirements. It um, got impacted by a natural disaster. And so it's, you know, we had one of our farmers, we were managing another farm's orchard for a while and we were running it as a pick your own. And he was fifth generation farmer and he came to us on a Tuesday and said, I've got a whole crop of Granny Smiths and they're a really bright green apple. I don't know if you have grannies over there, but they're one of Australia's sort of icon yeah, yeah, green we've, tart we've, apples. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was, loved them growing mm. up. Loved them. The grannies. Well, he had val- he had tree ripened his and they were quite yellow. And the supermarket said to him, we can't buy them. They're too yellow. They won't sell in the shops. And he said, but have you tried one? They are so, so much better. They are mouthwateringly amazing. They said, no, they're not the quintessential granny. They need to be green because you've had them on the, it's been a particularly hot summer. They're quite golden on one side. We won't take them. So he came to us on the Tuesday and said, I'm done. I now have to either push all these trees out and I'm not going to get anything for that crop. What do I do with them? And we said, let us run a pick your own because people want to know where their food comes from. He said, no, why would anyone want to know where their food comes from and why would anyone come and do the hard work that we're used to doing? By that Sunday, we convinced him to do it. We'd put the word out to our food network and literally hundreds and hundreds of people turned up and bought tons and tons of apples at a price that he dictated as opposed to the price that the supermarket dictated and pretty well cleared his crop. And he came to us that night in tears and said, never in a million years did I imagine that people would want to know my name. He said, do you know how many times people have asked me my name today? No one has ever asked me my name and they wanted to know my name so that they could remember me while they ate the food that I had grown for them. And he said that it has completely changed my understanding of what I should do with food and how food should be grown and who should be eating it and what it should that process should look like. I don't want to put my food on the back of a truck for an, with a nameless driver to take it to a nameless destination and become a nameless farmer. I, I, I want to I want to shorten the supply chain. What does that look like? So we worked with him to set it up as a UPIC orchard, which still runs actually. It's not far from us now. We I like the way you call them you. Like, I like the way you call it like just you, the letter you pick. You're kind of like, wow, like you haul or like you pick or you like, you know, I think, I think those you are pick. quite cool. I, I yeah. absolutely adore that story. That story like should be told everywhere. Like I think it's so beautiful. It's like the hairs in the back of my neck stood up. I felt like tears coming to my eyes. You know, it was like it's proper. It, it's what the world needs more. It's connection to the land, understanding the seasons. It's, you know, the appreciation of, as you said, the, the those Granny Smiths, they, they grew, you know, in a longer hot summer. So they went from their green into more yellow because they got burnt or they got a, a little bit of suntan. And as a result, they're probably sweeter. sweeter. There's more sugars. Yeah, of course. So much sweeter. They're beautiful. Wow. So that's what, like in essence, like that wonderful story embodies, you know, the shortening of the supply chain. 
And that's exactly kind of what it our does. food system is. And to so do. we in Alrana you pick um at heritage apple orchards. So we have planted a hundred different varieties of apple that harvest from January until June. And we've also planted about three kilometers of berries. There's about four to three kilometers of berries. Types. Three kilometers. Which sounds like a lot. It is. We have a farm. Eight, three kilometers is a lot. <laughs> when they're in hundred meter rows, um, they add up quite quickly. Like you end up with you end up with a lot of berries pretty quickly because you've got a lot of rows. What type but, of berries? Um, uh, brambles. So we don't do strawberries, but we do all the bramble berries. So we have about eight or nine different sorts of raspberries, both like summer and autumn. Tayberry, Loganberry. Oh, Loganberry, Marionberry, lo- Chesterberry. Tayberries are insane. I like, I adore them. <laughs> and I, like, if anyone doesn't know what a Tayberry is, it's like an elongated raspberry that once you pick it ripe, it's like sweet, jammy, magnificent in your mouth. Like, it's one of my all time favorite fruits. <laughs> They are. They're tr- they're, we find them tricky to grow organically because they get a rust on them. But anyway, we're treating that with goat milk whey at wow. the moment. Um, and we also have blueberries and um, pears. We've got quite a few varieties of pears. And then my kids run, um, my little girl does ice cream and uh, jam. And my boys do apple cider donuts. So Possibly the best donuts you know, in all of, of Australia. Possibly the best um, cider, <laughs> cider donuts. I like your little line yeah. there. It's possibly the only cider, apple cider donuts in Australia. So we're pretty clear we could own that title. I like that. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It's a very American tradition. So when we brought it back to Australia, only the Americans know what we're talking about. Everyone else says, what the heck is an apple cider donut? So, um, yeah, but we run lots of schools programs and lots of, because it's you pick, they get to meet the farmer and then they like to pick their own and they get to learn what different apples taste like and what different times of the year things come on. And um, we do jam making workshops and soap making workshops and wicking bed, uh, food growing and grafting and weaving and all of those things that upskill people's capability to live more in tune with the cycles of, of the natural world. And it's using the gateway of food such that like many people think an apple is just an apple. But when you do try comparing a Tideman Early Worcester to a James Grieve, to a Lord Lambert, to a Granny Smith, like to, to, to all these oh. different varieties, they're, they're so different. And even like I was remarking, in it, we're living in a house that we've rented for 15 years and the house was built 160 years ago. And uh, there's some apple trees that must be 40 years old. And they're like older varieties, like there's a James Grieve and a Lord Lambert. And these are like much more a softer, soapier, kind of like slightly citrus apple versus if I look at one that's recently planted, there's like a Jupiter, which is a crispy apple. And it's almost like those older, softer apples are less fashionable and less on vogue and more the crispy apple is much more on vogue at the moment. And how palate has changed. It's so true. Well, there's over 7,000 varieties of apple in the 7, world. 7,000? Wow. Um, 7,000. And in Australia, we've got about 4,000. And um, we at the farm only have 100. And we've... Only? We That's remarkable. We we growing more. I think you've 126. Yeah. I saw on your well, website it was 126 when I looked at it. Those lovely numbers that scroll as you go down. I was like, that- oh, that's cool. <laughs> Well, there's different varieties of pear. There were cherry as well, which is how we got to the 126. We've since pushed the cherries out. Um, there's lots of cherry growers around us, and so we encourage our guests to go and go and see other farmers for those. And also because it extends our season, like we we have a six month peaking season already, and um, really cherries come on about a month earlier than that. So that would make it seven months that we're open seven days a week, and so it just clips what that looks like a bit. Which suits us. It just gives us a little more family time. Yeah, nice. Um, and also, as my husband says, they're bloody finicky to grow organically. And so he says, I don't want sissy plants because I just want bomb proof ones. Yeah, dead so. right. Wow. Fair play. Pretty amazing what you're doing. Like, I love it. I love the concept like of just shortening the, the, the food chain because we have a four acre regenerative farm, um, all organic here, mm-hmm. where it's kind of multi varieties. I think we're growing about 50 different varieties of vegetables predominantly. There's some fruit, we have a few berries, wow. um, we have rhubarb and that, but we're trying to, because we have a cafe and shop, probably half of it goes to the cafe and shop, which is handy because when you talk about 50% of yeah. food, all food is wasted and most of it at the farm, sh- the farm gate or the wholesale, wasn't that what you said? I think it's around 30% in yes. Ireland, but that could be a number of years old. 
but just having the farm there, like very little goes to waste because it just goes straight down to the cafe and straight into the kitchen. Wow, that is amazing. Yeah, is, yeah that is. is that is a real gift. We um, did have our local food co-op that we were pushing ours through, but COVID made it really difficult for us to continue. And so that has sort of morphed into a different uh, structured organisation. But um, yeah, you get very good at when you're growing your own food at preserving in a whole way of creativity that you never imagined possible <laughs> so that you've got the ability to feed your family throughout the, the hungry months as well. Yeah, I think a huge part of this is connection. It's about like having that connection because you talked mm. about the longer s- supply chain, it's transactional versus the smaller one year. Everyone wanted to know the farmer's name and it's about having that connection, not only to the farmer, but to the variety of crop. And then just there's much more appreciation. And I think that's one of the sources of joy and happiness in life and ultimately meaning. It's connection and appreciation. I think through these sort of s- shorter supply chains, it's a total gateway to more appreciation, more in seasonality and more presence ultimately. Yeah, I think it changes your rhythm too. Someone, uh, I sat on a panel um, at a sustainability festival last week and they said, you know, how do you plan what you eat? And I said, I don't. I don't do any planning because it's completely dependent. Every single morning when I put my feet on the ground at five o'clock, I go for a walk in the bush and... I kind of feel into the season that I'm in and you know it intuitively where you're at, whether it's on the brink of turning or whether you're in the depth of that particular season. And there is never something I can't harvest. Like every month of every year there is something I could find either in the bush or on the roadside or in our paddocks or in our um, kitchen garden or in our hoop house. And that's what dictates what I'm cooking. And if I've got an absolute glut of something and I can't trade it with someone for something I don't have at the moment, then that's what I'm cooking. Now, I'm where we are living on zooks for months, zucchinis for months of the year. And, you know, in winter we are always living on potatoes and pumpkins because that's what stores and that's what's what gets us. But my room is very much determined by the season that we're in. And I think that puts you again in touch with what it is that you need. Your ancestral being knows what your body needs to be healthy in the environment that you're existing in. And if you're using food as one of the greatest prompts to do and be and truly live that way, then uh, it it changes the way you interact with your landscape and the way you feed your body so different the way you're living like that way like it's you know to put a label on it it would be categorized as homesteading but I love your approach using you've kind of rebranded it using as future steading I think this is a great concept (laughs) Uh, I've used future steading because people would say to me well it's all very well for you you live on land I don't live on land I live in an apartment in the city so how do I live like you and so the reality is that if you're future steading you're living in a way that enables us to live like tomorrow matters because you are creating a steady future. And so you're steadying and stabilizing the future by making decisions that are considerate of the seven generations in front of you and taking into account the knowledge of the seven generations behind you. And you're really truly thinking about making decisions that impact all of the living systems around you. So that could be the culture that you're impacting it could be the community that you're impacting it could be the animals and the way they've lived their life based on the decisions that you make for which things you buy and which things you don't it could be other humans that are at the end of a supply chain that are working in you know slave environments so so don't support that make decisions that actually result in a regenerative outcome not a degenerative one and not even a sustainable one. We haven't got time to be sustainable because that means we're maintaining status quo. It's time to push beyond status quo because our planetary boundaries can't cope with status quo. You know, we are six of the nine planetary boundaries surpassed. And so we've got just three left to ensure that we can stabilize our future. Earth will be fine. She doesn't need to be saved. She adapts and she can she can manage without human life on it. We can't though. So if we want a permanent future, 
then we need to actually recalibrate the way we make our decisions. And, you know, at the end of every decision you make is an outcome. So make them regenerative outcomes. Wow. Here, here. So like someone listening in an apartment going, yeah, I'm in it. I love what you're saying, Jade. I totally agree. I'm I'm caught in a loop though. I need to make money to pay my rent. I'm trying to make do. I get into the supermarket and all they yep. have is this and I don't know local farmers and I don't know local farmer market and I don't know how to read light and I don't know what depth of shadow means and I don't know about the colours of green and like I've never tried a yellow <laughs> Granny Smith and I'm lost and feck and I'm just going getting a pizza. Um, I would say start super simply. And start right now. Start right now by challenging everything that's around you and questioning it. Get really curious. Honour the fact that you've got the skills that you've got because of the life that you've lived and there's nothing wrong with that. But today you can start to change what that looks like. You can learn new skills. You can connect with community in different ways. You can change one thing a week. You know, it might be that you change, that you no longer buy jarred, um, garlic, but you find a way to, to get to know someone who grows garlic or grow 10 bulbs of it in a pot on a bench in your, on your balcony in your apartment and grow your own garlic. Um, join a local food co-op and buy bulk and, and reuse jars. Um, you know, join a sewing group and and teach each other. Join a fermenting group and teach each other. Uh, learn how to create wicking beds and do that at a local I um, love the sewing garden. club. Sewing club is cool. I'm here with Shawnee. Shawnee's <laughs> um, doing club. all the sound. And, and Shawnee's like, a, what I call you, a seamster, Shawnee? Yeah. A, a multifaceted man, or a, a renaissance man. But Shawnee's like, he looks like a bear wrestler. Like he's got a cool beard. He's big and strong and really secretly inside wants to be a wrestler one day. But um, Shawnee, uh, like, is this, like, knows how to fix his partner has a. Um, what do I call it? Vintage clothes store. And Shoney does all the kind of, you know, the fixing of stuff and sewing of stuff and that. So I think, I think sewing's cool. And I think fixing what we have. Can we talk briefly about that? The importance of like learning how to fix what we have. Because like even there, I was just saying there beforehand, I got a hole in a jumper that I really like. And like, it was like, (laughs) we were talking about, can can, can I get an elbow patch? Like here, can we do this? And can you teach me how to fix it? Well, I didn't say it. I asked, would he do it? But it was like, actually now it's like, will you teach me how to do it so I can (laughs) feel more empowered? because we live in a culture that's disposable and it's like get a new one and new is good and old is bad whereas like I love that famous um, a friend you used to always say I can't afford not to buy good quality and he'd like buy a pair yeah. of shoes that he'd get years out of and it didn't mind fashion yeah. it was just there was function over fashion yeah, yeah. well you can have both if you take yeah. your own identity into your own hands and create your own sort of look and feel I think um, using what you've got with the skills that you have and the community that you've got around you, really, I, I ask this question all the time when I'm on my future setting talks. Like, how much is enough? How, how about we? I love this topic. What yes. Looks What's like? enough for you? What's enough yeah. for you? What's enough for you? Well, enough. I'll tell you what enough for me is. Enough for me is when I've got enough room in my head that I'm not yelling at my kids endlessly. Like when I do a check-in with my kids on a weekend and they say to me, you have yelled at me all week because you've got no patience, you're intolerant of kid things and you're sort of snappy with us, then I know that I'm not giving myself enough space and time to actually be patient with the things that are the most important to me. I know that if my sex life is through the floor, it's because I'm full. My head is full and yeah, I haven't I love got that space measurement to give my of enough in a needs. sex life. Good on you. <laughs> well, you know, like if you're really busy and strung out, the last bloody thing oh, you want yeah, to see. Absolutely. Sex. But if life is feeling balanced and life is feeling good and you've, you're in a really good sort of flow with your partner, well, you have sex. Mm. Um, enough for me is knowing that I've got, I've got three really healthy kids that know where their food on their plate comes from. Even if it's 16, they think they're too cool to have those conversations. They were with me until they were about 14 and now they're like, oh, my God, it's all about permi regenerative food. So um, they're just not with me at the moment. But, you know, I They'll know come that back. food They'll on their come plate. Back. Oh, my God, I hope so. <laughs> Remains to be seen. But, you know, <laughs> um, I can, enough for me is knowing that when I – I um, put a call out to my my network to say, 
holy heck, I've got so many tomatoes, I don't know what to do with it. I get 10 or 15 people come back and say, oh, I'll have a kilo and I'll swap you lemons because I know you can't grow citrus where you are or I'll swap you um, avocados because you can't grow avocados where you are or I'll swap you some cow milk for some goat milk because I know your kids prefer cow milk and, and mine are in, like those intolerant, so I would love to swap. That for me is enough because it tells me that I've got a community that is deeply connected, that has completely got my back, that will fill all the gaps if I've got any and that, you know, enable a really rich, full life that feels like it has belonging and community around us. And it has resilience. Like we've been through ten, uh, three fires in the last 15 years and I've sat on the hilltop in our paddock where I can't see a foot in front of me turning off the irrigation on a 45 degree day the 10th day in a row of that and with my skirt over my head and I can't breathe crying thinking I can't do this and you know I had my phone ring from someone whose husband is also away fighting fires like mine is to say, I don't know you very well, but I know our fight, husbands are fighting fires together and I know you're at home with kids on your own and I know we're in the middle of a drought and I know that it's tomato picking season, so let's put our heads together and let's make Posada tomorrow so that we don't have to think about the fact that our husbands are on the front line fighting fires while our kids are strung out and worried and locked in a house because of the smoke. Like I know what it actually looks like to live in a an environment that is being directly impacted by a warming climate and as a farmer who lives in a remote or a regional area knowing I've got a community around me that will hold me is what my enough looks like wow beautiful here here I love that last bit like tears coming in my eye after you're talking about that jeez that sounds hard wow Fair play. Yeah, I don't want another one of those. It's been a couple of years since one of those seasons, but they are bloody tough and they wear you down. And we get to the point now where our littlest one says, oh, no, is it summer again? I hate summer. Dad goes away and it's dangerous and it's hot and we get locked inside because it's so smoky. We've now had so many summers where we're on fire that our kids now fear summer. And, um, you know, I, I don't need new shiny shit to fill those gaps. I need my community around me to put their arms around me and let me cry in their sh- on their shoulder and entertain my kids when they need a different house to go to because they've been locked in for weeks on end because the smoke stings their eyes and makes them cough. And, you know, that, that's what enough looks like. We've got to recalibrate enough and we've got to recalibrate success. And as a culture, we've got to do it now because we are hurtling to a place that we don't have the skills right now to exist in comfortably. And there is something in every one of us, and this is kind of where I started, um, you know, we are a custodial species. We have the capability to use our head and our hands and our heart, and we can do that in unison And that makes us pretty bloody amazing as a species. But we have to reactivate our ancestral knowledge systems. They sit in every one of us. And it's not okay for us to continue to sit back and let this state of dis-ease dominate the way we make our decisions so that we we prioritise convenience and cost over community and um, ecological systems like the thing that will hold us when the shit hits the fan isn't capability to go to the shops and buy something it'll be our capability to to reuse and, and rebuild and to share and to compromise and to integrate and to um, combine forces in a newly formed culture that is accepting and not divisive and you know, it's going to be the people around us and the ecosystem that does or doesn't hold us. Yeah, haven't you, Sam? So, so with here, here, like I think ancestral, ancestral 
connecting with our ancestral wisdom is just understanding, as you said, seven generations previously and how they've lived and respect that and understand that we're just simply a blip in the river that, of life that goes on. And if human life is to continue, we need to do our peace and we need to start to live with enoughness and knowing what enoughness is and knowing that there's more to life than the next shiny object. And as you said, it's ultimately, it's about community that when the shit hits the fan and life gets difficult and we're all struggling, it's like, do we have people to turn to that will mind us? And do we have friends that grow food? And do we grow food? And do we have skills that we can share with them so that we can just all Mm. harmonious integrate and work together? Mm. Food and medicine. I think medicine often gets forgotten. And, you know, witches were burnt at the stake in your country, especially in your your continent, especially. Um, they They had knowledge that we can only dream of and so too do our Indigenous elders here in our country. And they understand landscapes like we can't even imagine and they knew how to heal their bodies and they knew how to heal their heads and their hearts and collectively they knew how to, to maintain health and medicine sovereignty. So we not only need to talk about food sovereignty and shorter supply chains, but we need to talk about detaching ourselves from big pharma and relearning the skills that our bodies need us to relearn so that we can actually heal ourselves and and um, take care of ourselves when we don't have access to the techno solutions that are built on these stacked complex systems that you know don't, don't have capacity to function in a in a finite planet yeah here here wow i'm Hundred percent with you. So, like, how, how, how do we start to apply this? Like, I know you said for anyone listening, just to simply to start now, start now, and start small, and try to link into other communities that are already doing this and building. And it's a, it's about collectively building momentum, really, isn't it? It's about, and just slowly moving from one percent or point one percent of obs- obscurity to moving it more to two percent, three percent, four percent, and then suddenly. You know, you start hitting critical mass and suddenly everyone's sewing and fixing and knowing the 4,000 <laughs> varieties of apples that grow in Australia. <laughs> and that becomes the norm again. Yeah, I think it's very easy to get disillusioned because we think, but I'm just one person. What what can little old me do? And sure, I can see that that's disillusioning, especially when you see that there is, you know, policy change and, and um, government impact feels almost impossible and untouchable and out of our reach to to influence. But the reality is that governments have always followed. They are led by the people who vote them in. In democratic countries, which you live in and which I live in, the people are the people who collectively vote our decision makers in. And if we start to change the way, the lens that we look through and the way that we apply our thinking, and we collectively grow a reframed version of what enough looks like and what success looks like and what we actually want our governments to be supporting, policy does change and systems can change. And operating in a way that assumes endless growth um, because it's more cost-effective and because it's more convenient actually isn't the pathway forward to systemically changing the way we exist. And so it does take compromise and it does take discomfort and it does take a reframing of what makes you feel content. You know, let's imagine that we lived in a life that was actually paced to a human scale, not a machine scale. We are not machines. We are humans and we need to operate accordingly. You know, we we need to move at walking pace we need to absorb ideas as rapidly as we're capable of absorbing ideas once upon a time our day would consist of significant blocks of time staring into the long horizon using our imagination contemplating survival and thrival and village complexity And that was as much as we had capacity for because that's actually what we're suited for. We weren't built to be stimulated in this hyper environment where we were staring at a screen 
that was in the short horizon that was pummeling new messages at us relentlessly and filling our mind with um, cons- consumptive ways of being. Like the most powerful thing that we can do is just stop. Push back on those endless white noise messages that tell us that we need more, that we need bigger, that we need new. Shut your laptop, shut your phone, look to the long horizon. Let your imagination run wild. Be still, be calm, feel your heartbeat. Co-regulate with someone that you love by putting your hand on their chest and looking into their eyes and taking 10 deep breaths. Just stop. Stop and push back on the messaging that tells us that there are tech solutions to everything, every problem that we could possibly imagine because it can't be the reality. We don't live in a world where we have endless cheap energy. That is not that is not the answer. The answer is to recalibrate back to what we were for millions of years and you know, it re, it re it redefines what we need to be as humans and how we operate in the world that's holding us. And it's not as a separate individual. It's as a deeply meshed symbiotic particle of something that is so much bigger. And we are each just one of those things. But when we come together we could potentially be magnificent here, here. It's so almost, we've got the, it's almost we've like got the ability to do that. No, no, you keep going. You keep going. You're, you're in flow. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, we've got your question was, you know, how do we do that and not lose hope? You start small, you reframe the lens that you're looking through. You observe the, you know, all the little things around you and you find joy in a swelling bud and an opening bloom. You find joy and magnificence in the feeling of grass under bare feet. You connect with others that are doing the same thing and you reframe what enough looks like so that success for you is deep cohesion with place, with people and with yourself in a a system that, or in a flow that is representative of the natural world, not one that's been curated by a technocentric man. Yeah, yes, please, 100%. It's almost like you're two twin boys. One is in like very much relaxed and passive and kind of <laughs> lets life come and the other is like, let's make it happen now and spot detail. And it's almost like we're living through the eyes of just one of them and ultimately it's only when the two of them that work together that we find that harmony. Yeah. And it's almost like that in a way because it sounds like they're two opposites of the same, like that when they work together, there's synchronicity, they, there's that uh, synergy like it's like two different paradigms come together to create something that's much greater. And I think humanity, we're living currently, at least in the developed nations, we're living too much in one side. And it's like we need to connect with that more in flow, the rhythm in nature, the appreciation in nature, the looking at the long horizon, you know, co-regulate and all these beautiful things that it's like almost that. Uh, yeah. Start with a sit spot. Find a sit spot today. A sit Work spot. That's a spot just to sit and watch. Is. Yeah, every day I try and sit, and I can't do it these two weeks. I'm away with work, but um, I try and sit. I've got two sit spots. I've got one <laughs> like that in sit spot. my... My sit spot. I thought you said yeah, zit spot. It's like literally... where I sit and I squeeze zits. I thought that's what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no zit squeezing, <laughs> but sit spotting, and I try and sit it in as many days of the year that I possibly can, and I observe the ants, then I observe the fungi, and I observe the moss, and I observe the differing temperature and I observe, um, you know, the pollen on the water and I observe the different bird sounds. And across the year I see such enormous change that I couldn't possibly have ever acknowledged that if I didn't take the time to spend just 10 minutes a day in that one particular spot, just breathing deeply and really observing. And if that is all you do, it costs you nothing it takes just 10 minutes, which you could probably take from your screen time. It's, let's be honest, we all spend too much time on our bloody devices. And just carve some of that time out so that you can really recalibrate and um, connect with your surrounds and the, the changing and the flows of the season. 
Sit spotting is the one I'm going to take. I love that. I kind of have a more moving spot. We swim in the sea every day at sunrise, so I see it. The same little beach out changes every day. And it's only, we've been doing it for about eight years, but it's like, it really does, you appreciate the change in the seasons, even like how the tides change the sand on the beach that day or how there's more seaweed today or, oh, wow, there's a little bit of fluff on the sea there. They didn't know that. Oh, the cormorants are back. How are you, cormorants? We saw a seal today. How exciting. You know, little things like that are always, always spring or autumn will bring these dramatic sunrises and summer can be just more, you know, they can be a bit boring. Not boring, like they're beautiful, but like if you get 10 of the same after, you're kind of like, oh, I want a bit of cloud, a bit more drama. But yeah. yeah, see, that sounds amazing. Do you swim every day? Yeah, probably swim is probably the loose word. When it's winter and it's really, really cold, you dip. But we call it swimming, but, you know, dipping doesn't sound the same. But like when it's really cold, oh, yeah, wow. yeah, we get in every day. And there's a whole group of us. There's a great community in it. Really great community. Oh, that sounds magnificent. I really love that. I um, hope one day I get to visit. Come, come join and bring your L, the Dobros. We can show them we have a bakery. <laughs> we have a bakery and a cafe. Our, our business is called The Happy Pair because, like, we're a pair of twins. You know, and there's I loads of parts to business. So it should it's be P A I R. Yeah, but it's we started with a fruit and veg shop. So, you know, pears. I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Are you two different? We're, I'm probably not the best one to say it, but we're very similar. Like, genetically, we're 99.9 .9 recurring identical. We're mirror twins. So I'm left handed, he's right handed. And we are quite no, different, but we're also very similar. Like, and it's like, some people say, I was talking to the really loud one. It's like, it depends on which day, like one will be louder, <laughs> one will be more passive. You know, it depends. It, it, we're, we're very, like we finish each other's sentence. If he was here, like you're always kind of, I'm sorry, Dave wasn't here today. I guess there, there's, there's babies I would possibly have coming. To you would have seen it because it's, you finish each other's sentence. You're like, you're kind of sharing thoughts very fluidly. Like it's very easy and you can kind of read each other very, very well. It's beautiful. We love um, it. It's one of the greatest joy I have in life is having a twin. Because it's like you have that unconditional um, support. I used to say when they were little, it's like a superpower, but it's also an absolute curse because you can push each other's buttons like no other human can. And um, boy, if anyone tries to get in between the two of you, even if you've got a knife at the other one's neck, they then turn on you. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but my boys can honestly be putting each other through the wall. And if I get involved, they both turn on me. Yeah. And you think, ah, why, why get involved? Oh, it's, and that's twins in a nutshell. But like, I think like when we mm -hmm. reach a certain age, you just stop fighting because you realize like it's totally, there's no point in it. Like you're just going to wreck <laughs> each other. So you, you don't fight anymore. You might bicker a little bit, but underneath like nothing's ever a problem you know that way mm. there's that unconditional support it really support. is a superpower isn't it yeah yeah it's great yeah yeah tell the lads they're welcome come mm. anytime because we have a bakery mm, so they can I try their dough bros to meet an adult group of twins wow yeah that, yeah, yeah everything sounds incredible well for my second book I, I did a, a US tour for my first book um, up the east coast of America but I had lots of people in the UK saying please can you bring the book over here and I'll come so huddle for the second book you can huddle over yeah, here yeah I'll do a huddle too a huddle tour in the UK. So we're Ireland, so just a little island beside England and we're like on the East Coast, just south of Dublin. It's cool. We've a cool little setup. It's really cool. Come visit. You can come. Dave's, Dave's building a little spare kind of like guest, like little kind of bit in his garden. So come stay. Wow. Sounds like you've just created the most amazing place. Well, yours sounds pretty remarkable too. Like very remarkable. I mean, you know how hard yeah. work it is. People oh, say, it's God, a... I just want to live like this. And you think, all right, you're welcome to the midnight head torch weeding session because yeah. that's yeah. what happens. Yep, I know that. Like anyone kind of romanticizes, oh, I'm thinking of starting a food business. Like first thing is you have to like hard work. There's romance, there's beauty, there's amazing moments. It's incredible. But like you have to be a grafter. If you're not a grafter, don't get yeah. into it. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true, isn't it? You really have to revel in the doing and um, you have to be happy to do it in a discomfort, state of discomfort because it's often raining and it's often muddy and it's often full of animal poo and, you know, it's it's all the things that kind of make your nose know, screw up if you haven't really thought it through. And yeah. you're often broke and you're often particularly tired. Yeah, yeah, I know all those bits well. All that. Yeah, which is yeah. Jade, you're remarkable. You really are. You're so eloquent and so, even when I was listening there, it was like, very rarely have I listened to someone tell stories where like there's tears coming to my eyes that they're so real and so oh, connecting to my heart. So thank you. You're, you're very elegant with how you talk. 
Thank you. I think um, I wrote a book and my very best friend said, you're not an author, you're just a talker on paper. <laughs> I was like, hmm, I'll run with that. I'm happy with that. <laughs> well, that's cool. So your first book is Future Steading. You're working on a new one called Huddle. For anyone from Australia, your farm is Black Barn Farms and there's like you pick. Oh. And can people order your fruit? Like you sell fruit trees, like amazing variety of fruit trees on your website. I was looking. Like even, yeah, I didn't know half the trees. varieties. And like we have a fruit shop for 20 years. No. Yeah, look, there's just so many. You mentioned some before that I thought, oh, I've not heard of that one. Um, yes, and I also have the podcast, the Future Steading podcast. Yes, and did look at that. Um, that is on a bit of hold at the moment because I work full time off farm at the moment as the CEO of Sustainable Table, which is an organisation that um, identifies incredible regenerative ag or local food system projects across the country and then we bring investors to the table to fund those projects that would otherwise be probably, you know, too transformative to actually get mainstream funding. And so um, that's the work that I do, mostly on my feet in front of audiences who um, are eager to understand why regenerative farming is so critical to and systems change around this sector is so critical to planetary boundary support. So um, I am off farm quite a bit at the moment, but um, yes, you could also look sustainable table up. Yeah, I didn't even see that one. Wow, okay, must uh, dig into that one more. Look, I think most people don't realise I have an off-farm job and often that's because I sort of have an on-farm job and an off-farm job in equal part full-time, but um, yeah, it's not really the public side of what I do, but it's equally as... Related. Yeah, yeah. Wow, Jade, you're amazing. I look forward to meeting you. Yeah, that would be amazing. I would love to do that. The book doesn't come out until May 2025, which sounds like a 500 oh, wow. years away, but there's a lot. It just takes a really long time to get illustrated books to print. Um, but I will look to come to your summer either later that year or the following year. Okay, our summers aren't that warm, so you'd be happy. Rained a lot this summer here. <laughs> They're not in Stanley either. No, 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 no. Rained really a lot. But uh, yeah. But th- you still swim or paddle. I'll come paddle yeah. with you with bare feet. Yeah, great. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much, Jade. You're amazing. You really are. And hope your time in Melbourne goes great. And love to the Dobros. Thank, thank you. I'm intrigued by adult twins. I look forward to meeting you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jade. Cheers. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.